Okay, this is designed to kind of help with these 1.3 problems. So if you're looking at these problems and you're having problems with the problems, you don't really know where to start, then I'm going to just kind of go through and help you read them carefully and uh, get some hints. I'm not going to do the problems. You can check Mr. Koo's website for the numerical answers or in the back of your book. Um, but here we go. So a non-carbonated soft drink contains an unknown amount of citric acid. If 100 milliliters of the soft drink requires 33.51 milliliters of 0.012 molar NaOH to neutralize the citric acid completely, how many grams of citric acid does the soft drink contain per 100 milliliters? The reaction is given. Okay, so what do we really have to start with? We really have 33.51 milliliters of this uh, solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with this 33.51 milliliters of citric acid, okay, um, I'm sorry, of NaOH, excuse me, NaOH, and then we're going to go from uh, milliliters to liters, and then we can use the uh, molarity here as a conversion factor, so it's 0 0.0102 uh, moles of NaOH per every liter, it's really sloppy, sorry. Okay, and then now we can go back to our equation. If I'm, I've just now figured out moles of the NaOH. Okay, so if I know moles of NaOH, I can figure out moles of my citric acid. Okay, and if I know moles of my citric acid, I can find grams of citric acid. So I'm going to have two more steps in here to figure out the, um, I'm going to use the molar mass of my citric acid. I'm going to use the uh, moles and moles, so 3 to 1 is going to be this guy, and then I'm going to have molar mass of citric acid for this one, and so when I'm all done, I'm going to have grams of my citric acid already, and the question is how many grams of citric acid does the soft drink contain, so I just got there. So point is, I can use molarity as a conversion factor, I can use the numbers in the balanced equation as a conversion factor, and I'm going to be using the molar mass of citric acid, which you have to calculate as a conversion factor. Other than that, it's a really simple problem. Okay, number two, vitamin C is a simple compound. Besides being an acid, it's also a reducing agent. And I think that's what they're talking about when they say this is a uh, uh, antioxidant, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, one method for determining is to mix it with some bromine. Okay, so here's the reaction for that. So suppose that a one gram chewable vitamin C tablet can, uh, requires 27.85 milliliters of this molarity bromine solution for titration to the equivalence point. So we're saying that if I wanted to completely use up all of the vitamin C, I'd have to add 27.8 milliliters of this 0.102 molar bromine. So how many grams of vitamin C are in the tablet? Now, this is very similar to the one before. So we're going to start with the milliliters. Okay, so we'll start with milliliters. And if I know milliliters, I can go to liters. And that's just metric. And then I can use my uh, uh, molarity as a conversion factor. So I can get moles of bromine per liter of that solution. So there's my uh, molarity. And then I can use my equation. So for every one bromine, okay, it's going to be one mole of um, my uh, acetic acid. So I can do that kind of problem. And then once I have moles of acetic acid, then I can get the grams of acetic acid, and that's just going to be the molar mass of that stuff. So that's the way we're going to set it up. So I'm going to start off with the milliliters, okay, milliliters to liters, molarity is a conversion factor, the uh, balanced equation, and then the molar mass and then we get our answer. Okay, for number three, okay, sodium thiosulfate sulfate is used as a fixer in black and white photography. Assume you have a bottle of sodium thiosulfate sulfate, you want to determine its purity. The thiosulfate sulfate ion can be oxidized with iodine. Okay, so here we have an equation, iodine and S2O3. Again, if you use 40.21 milliliters of 0.241 molar iodine, what is the weight percent in a 3.232 gram sample of the impure material. Okay, weight percent. Now that's the key, the key one. So weight percent is how many grams of sodium thiosulfate per, okay, we have a, two point, a 3.23, so we're going to take this, got to find this number, 
and then we're going to divide by 3.232 grams of the sample, then times 100% to get the answer. So again, it's like the one before. Okay, we're going to find grams. So we start with our milliliters. We're going to go milliliters to liters, and we're going to use the molarity, okay, as a conversion factor. That'll get us to moles of iodine. If I know moles of iodine, I can get the moles of uh, thiosulfate, 1 to 2. And then once I have that, then I can get 2 grams of thiosulfate, okay, Na2S2O3. And if I have grams of thiosulfate, then I'm going to divide by the sample, and I'll get my answer. Okay, 4. Suppose you mix some uh, iron chloride with some sodium hydroxide. What is the maximum mass in grams of iron hydroxide that precipitates? Which reactant is in excess? What is the molar concentration of the excess reactant remaining in solution after the maximum mass of iron hydroxide has been precipitated? So this sounds very complicated, but it's really not. Okay, let's look at it. So first off, uh, let's get an equation. So I have iron chloride and we're going to mix that with sodium hydroxide. And we have ionic compound, ionic compound, so we're going to change partners, double replacement. So we're going to get iron hydroxide. And we know that, you know, hydroxides are generally precipitates. So that one is. And we get sodium chloride. And the important part here is we're going to have to balance. And it looks something like this. So we're going to need those uh, molar uh, and, uh, the moles there to use in our equation. So what do we have? We have 25 milliliters of 0.234 molar iron chloride and we have 42.5 milliliters of 0.453 molar sodium hydroxide. So what we're going to have to do this time is figure out well who's going to actually run out so that sounds like an icebox problem. So I would set up an icebox Okay, you're going to take volume times molarity to get moles of iron chloride. You're going to do volume times molarity to get moles of sodium hydroxide, and these two are zero. And because this one runs out three times faster, the sodium hydroxide, than the iron chloride, you're going to figure out, well, who is your limiting reactant? And that's important. So one of these is going to end up being uh, zero. Okay, once you get the change row, then you can fill in all the change. And then the question here is, you know, so who's, which reactant is excess, which is limiting reactant? That's easy. So what's the molar concentration of the excess reactant? So we can say, well, which of these are we, I'm sorry, that's not what we want. Which of these is the excess reactant? Okay. And then once you figure that out, you would say, what is the concentration? So you're going to get moles of either one, whichever one is running out, because the other one's going to be zero. And you divide by the total volume. So that's the only little bit slightly tricky part. Okay, so what's the total volume? Well, you're going to add those two volumes there together to get the total volume. So you're going to get moles divided by the total volume, and that will give us the um, uh, molar concentration of the excess reactant. And that's that kind of problem. Okay, you wish to determine the weight percent of copper in a copper containing alloy after dissolving a sample of alloy in acid. You add an excess of Ki, so the copper and iodine undergo the reaction. So the copper and iodine turn into a precipitate, and then the iodine that's left becomes I3 minus. Now the liberated I3 minus is titrated with sodium thiosulfate according to this equation. Phew! So this is the equation I think we're going to be using. And what are we trying to find? It says, if 26.32 milliliters of 0.101 molar sodium thiosulfate is required for titration to the equivalence point, what is the weight percent of copper in a 0.251 gram sample of the alloy? So again, what we really want to get, we want to get grams of copper. And if we can get grams of copper, we're going to divide by 0.251 grams of the alloy times 100%, and that'll give us the weight percent. So we're really looking for grams of copper, and then we'll be okay. Well, how do we do that? So what do we know? We have uh, the volume, so we have 26.32 milliliters. Okay, so we get that number, and we can go from milliliters to liters, that's metric, and then we're going to use our uh, con uh, molarity as a conversion factor, so we're going to get moles per liter, that's our sodium thiosulfate, 
And then we have to say, okay, well, I want to figure out moles of thiosulfate. I want to get back to copper that we had. Um, so we're going to have to go back to here. So we want to connect. The connection between those is our I minus. So we're going to have one conversion. We're going to say, if I know the moles of Na2S2O3, then I can find moles of I3 minus. Okay, that's from this balanced equation. And then if I know moles of I3 minus, then I can get moles of copper. Okay, and the moles of copper, uh, I can say uh, two of those for every one of those. And if I know moles of copper, then I can get, uh, you know, for every copper 2 plus, there must have been a copper metal. So I can get that to grams using the molar mass, or I can go copper 2 plus to copper neutral and copper neutral to grams of copper neutral. So I can just use, you know, molar mass over here, and that will end up giving me the grams of copper that I need. So again, it's the same thing. We have volume. We're going to uh, use the molarity as a conversion factor. And this time we have two um, uh, stoichiometric ratios to use as conversions, and that'll get us the moles of copper, which is also going to be the same as the moles of the copper uh, metal, and then we can just turn that to grams. Okay, iron reacts with iron hydrochloric acid to produce iron chloride and hydrogen gas. The hydrogen from the reaction of 2.2 grams of iron is collected in a 10 liter flask. What's the pressure? Okay, uh, at 25 degrees. So we can see what's happening. We're going to change that to Kelvin. Okay, we got a volume. We have a temperature. Okay, we're asking for a pressure. Alrighty, so if we knew moles of the hydrogen gas, then we could do a PV equals NRT problem. So that's coming a little bit later, but we're looking for moles, and that's what we wanted to figure out. So the question is, if I know I have 2.2 grams of iron, okay, can I figure out how many moles of hydrogen I get? And of course you can. So we can go from grams to moles using the molar mass of, hyd of iron, and then we're going to go from moles of iron to moles of hydrogen using our balanced equation. That's the stoichiometry part. And then we're going to take that number and put it into our PV equals NRT equation, and we'll calculate the pressure of the hydrogen gas. And that's the kind of problem. Okay, sodium azide, the explosive compound in car airbags, decomposes according to this equation. What mass of sodium azide is required to produce the nitrogen needed to inflate 25 milliliter at 1.3 and blah, blah, blah. So we can kind of see here, I've got a temperature, change it to Kelvin. I've got a pressure, I've got a volume, so I can do PV equals NRT and calculate my moles of nitrogen. Well, if I know my moles of nitrogen, okay, then I can go ahead and change moles into grams, and I shouldn't have done that, okay, because what I want to do, sorry, is I want to go moles of nitrogen, sorry, moles of nitrogen, into moles of sodium azide, and I want to get grams of sodium azide. So once I know the moles here, I can start with that, then I'll just go to my uh, balanced equation, and so for every three moles of nitrogen, I get two moles of sodium azide, weird, okay, and then I can go to grams of sodium azide, and then get my answer. So PV is NRT and a simple stoichiometry. Okay, now we have a, a nice 2008 okay, uh, uh, equation here. So list an appropriate observation that provides evidence of a chemical reaction. Well, this is a little bit tough. We're going to put in a solid, and you may or may not know that lead nitrate is a white crystalline solid, but we know it since it's nitrate, it's going to dissolve. So when we mix it together with sodium iodide, which is already a solution, and that would be uh, color this as well, it's going to form this precipitate. So if we're dumping in a solid, we're going to get a solid, and I think that might be a little bit hard to observe, uh, and we get sodium nitrate, which will dissolve. But it turns out that lead PBI2, okay, and this is kind of just trivia now, is yellow. So it's a yellow precipitate. So if you know that, 
then you can say, okay, the evidence here is that we get a yellow precipitate. I think if you said that there was a precipitate formed, uh, you know, you would be okay. But it is a yellow precipitate, because how do you know? You put in the solid in, and you get a solid, but it changes color. Okay, calculate the number of moles of each reactant. Okay, well, here we have volume times molarity, and here we have grams. So if you know grams, you can get moles. If you know volume and molarity, you can get moles. So you can actually have to calculate moles. Identify the limiting reactant. Okay, well, this sounds like a uh, icebox sort of thinking. If you have one mole for this for every two moles of this, okay, just figure out which one is going to run out first, and that's going to be your limiting reactant. And it says show calculations. So I would say you want to do something like, um, you know, if I have this many moles of lead nitrate, how many moles of sodium iodide do I need? And I have more or have fewer than I do need, so you would show that. Okay, for part D, calculate the molar concentration of nitrate in the mixture after the reaction is complete. Molar concentration. So here we go. We say, well, how many nitrates do I have? Well, we're talking about these nitrates, but that's the same as these nitrates. The nitrates, you know, are going to be uh, floating around either way. So using the information we have, we're just going to go back and calculate how many nitrates. Now the last part I think is kind of interesting. And it says, okay, circle the diagram below that best re uh, represents the results of the mixture uh, as completely as possible, after the reaction reacts as completely as possible and explain your choices. So the clues here are what's precipitating, okay? So do you think that there's a precipitate? Because if you think there's no precipitate, you can go for that guy. But if you think there is a precipitate, then you have two choices. Is it uh, PBI2, okay, for this one, this one, or this one? Or do you think it's lead nitrate as a precipitate? Okay, so that's one kind of question. So you can go through and, and do some eliminations here. Okay, so hopefully you realize that, you know, when you do your reactions, you are getting a precipitate, and it is not lead nitrate, okay? Lead nitrate is one of your reactants that's going to dissolve. So you should have gone through and at least eliminated those two. Then your job is to think, well, what is going to be in solution? You know, what's left over? Uh, you know, what did not react? Because you figured out the limiting reactant, so figure out your excess reactant. And look at these ions here and figure out who's going to be there. They all have sodium, so sodium's not your concern. These have nitrates, uh, so this one has nitrates, this one has nitrates, okay. Um, slightly different, oh no, this one has lead ions, that's what's different. Okay, so this has lead and sodium. So if you think lead is left over, this would be a good answer. If you think that there is no lead or iodide left over, and here it looks like we have some iodide left over. So from your uh, icebox chart, who's going to be left over? That's going to let you figure out which of these is the best one and explain it. And that's the problem set.